Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast, episode 53. We are talking today to Dr. Adam Lubke. Dr. Lubke is a Grammy-nominated choral educator who works at Fredonia up in New York, and he is going to share so much tangible information, especially about how you too can raise the bar for every singer. Teaser, it's about the people, and this one is a good one. So grab your notes. You're going to want to write some of these things down. As always, this episode is brought to you by our friends at the Kennison Choral Company. If you have not yet checked out their calculator, there's a link, emilybirch.org slash sponsors. Click the KCC picture and it'll take you directly to that calculator. And that calculator, after this episode, could be where you start as you think about where your singers are, where your people are, where your community is, and what you can do to help them raise the bar to the next level. I don't want to give anything else away because this episode, as you can tell, I'm recording this intro after we recorded it, it left me ready and reeling to brainstorm and to get creative, and I hope it does the same for you. Jump over to patreon.com slash musicedmatters if you want to join the conversation. And don't forget, we have Teacher PD Weekend coming up in July. More details on that in episode 48 and coming soon down the line. But oh my goodness, you have to hear Dr. Adam Lupke and how he, as a Grammy-nominated conductor, raised the bar for his entire choir. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are welcoming Grammy-nominated choral conductor, educator, awesome human extraordinaire, Dr. Adam Lupke. Hey, Adam. Hi, Emmy. How are you? I'm so excited to see you. How, how we've known each other since what, 2008, maybe? 2008, yeah. Florida State. I love yes, the, I... the background you've got there. Thanks. It's my new thing whenever I interview one of my FSU friends, um, both ones I know and don't know. If we have the FSU blood, I put it in the backdrop. Um, you were a second year when I was a first year master's? That sounds right. I was doing my second year of the doctor. I started in 2007. So That's right. yeah. That's right. I remember you were super organized. And so this morning when we were, I was so excited to have him like, I know Adam's going to be at least five minutes early. So I, <laughs> I turned on the Zoom room extra early today. <laughs> it was so much fun. I've been really looking forward to chatting with you. Will you tell the listeners who is Dr. Adam Lubke? Yeah, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, and um, because I was um, in that region, I learned about a a choir called the American Boy Choir, and they were based in Princeton, New Jersey. So I joined the American Boy Choir when I was 11, and we uh, immediately found myself in um, Czechoslovakia. It was still Czechoslovakia at the time, and traveling around the world and singing at Carnegie Hall with um, Kathleen Battle and Wynton Marsalis and all this stuff. So... I just sort of jumped into, I'd always been a great, uh, you know, I loved singing and sang in, at elementary school and all that. And all of a sudden jumped into this sort of professional realm of singing. And then I just needed more of that. I wanted to find the best choirs to sing. in. so that's how I kind of traced my story. I'm like, I'm going to, I want to find the best choir I can sing in. And so I, for college, I went to St. Olaf College because I saw the St. Olaf Choir do, give a concert when I was in high school. I was like, I want to sing in that choir. And then after um, St. Olaf, I went to Westminster Choir College um, for my master's and got to sing with Westminster Choir and Westminster Symphonic Choir. And then I sort of struck out and, um, you know, did all kinds of crazy odd jobs and random music jobs. And I like to tell this story to students. It's like, you just kind of do what you have to do. I had all kinds of adjunct positions in Kentucky. I lived in Lexington, Kentucky, as well as like did catering work for Jerry Bruckheimer and like all kinds of just crazy stuff. Um, and then ended up at Florida State for my doctorate with um, Andre Thomas, where I get to meet you and so many wonderful people. And um, now I've been um, in Western New York for about five years. And I uh, teach at um, SUNY Fredonia, which is one of the larger state music schools, state schools with the music programs. Um, we have, oh, like 140 voice majors between music theater and therapy and all of that stuff. So it's a nice, big, robust program. And I teach voice and conducting there. And I also am the music director for the Buffalo Philharmonic Chorus. I've um, been doing that for five years. And so that's a big um, a big chorus of amateur singers. Primarily, we have some some paid singers. But um, it's, it's, it's like a big community choir um, uh, that gets to sing with the orchestra, which is 
like awesome. It's so much fun. <laughs> I love that that goes full circle back to where you started at 11, finding, you know, professional choir experiences. Before we go deeper, can we talk more about this whole piecemealing what happened between master's and doctorate? Because I love this. I, I would say I'm a triangle in a square world because I don't follow the normal path. I'd love to hear more about what you did. So when you got out of Westminster, you did what first? Um, I, I literally, like I had I looked for jobs, but not real. I mean, not as seriously as I ought to have probably. And um, so, and also my, uh, my girlfriend now wife at the time was, went off to do her master's at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. So I'm like, well, I'm going to just strike out to Kentucky and see what I can do. And I ended up having a church job um, at a small rural church. Um, I think the choir had like six people in it. And um, here I am coming from Westminster, you know, singing with, uh, at ACDA conferences and stuff like that. And, um, and so I did that and I ended up, um, also, um, to conducting choirs at Moorhead state university, which is out in Eastern Kentucky in Moorhead. Um, Greg Detweiler is the conductor there and he took a chance on me and I was, I'm forever grateful for him for doing that. Um, cause I got a lot of great experience doing that. Um, and I, tr I drove an hour and a half every Monday night to, 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 to conduct those choirs, but I worked a day job, you know, in an HR office um, for a while. And um, I had some experience doing catering work. So that was like the first thing I did. It pays well. And it was, you know, I'm, I was young, so I could be up all the all hours of the night and pretty much every weekend in the summer and fall, I was doing catering work. And, um, and then, I, you know, I eventually got more and more stuff. So I started teaching at a private school part time and that became full time. So over three years, um, just more, I got a different church job and was able to put on, you know, a Vivaldi Gloria and Mozart mass and, you know, do some more stuff. So I just had to sort of strike it out, strike out and, and make, make it happen. I, I mean, I had like five or six different, um, 1099s coming in at one point. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the fun, right? What did you learn from catering and this HR job that helps you today in the music world? Um, the HR job actually has taught me a lot about um, sort of um, how to help people because I was I was literally hired to help people. Um, it was at a, a book binding plant, and I was hired to help people understand their healthcare plans <laughs> and like the well, options. So I had to really like I had to understand what healthcare plan options are, which were just completely Byzantine and still are, and um, then explain it to people who were just coming off like the third shift, you know. Um, and so I like, try to, so I'd, it really got me to sort of cut through the, the, um, the, the, the difficulty and the, and the fat and get right to like, okay, this is what, what this means for you. This is the, what, how it lays out. And that's really helpful for me. Um, and it's one of the things I'm, I, I, talk, I talk about in raising the bar is like just getting right to the point and being really clear um, and, and understanding what people need and how you can communicate to them in that way. So that was really helpful. Um, in that in that environment um and catering like it was just you know um meeting lots of different people like everybody in, in catering you know that's not their their final job you know there are a few who are the chefs or like the the head people who've been doing it and make a career out of hospitality but everybody sort of is on a path somewhere and so at the, intersecting with all these different people was really cool um and you know and and just there's a lot of sort of self-starter in catering it's like because the time limit is like, okay, are there two hours or three hours for an event and everything has to get done and there's never enough time. So it's mm -hmm. just like, what can I do now? What can I do now? What can I do now? And so it was very much like problem solving and, and keeping, um, keeping uh, focused on just getting something done um, because there's so always transfers. something to get done. <laughs> this is how incredible that you were able to go from these two amazing choir schools and all of this professional choir experience from age 11 to your early 20s. And you were able to support Sarah on her journey at UK while also learning these amazing transferable skills and to see them pay off. I'm just saying this for, I want to hear it for myself later. Yeah. The stuff you're doing now will pay off later if you're intentional about the transfer and the time. This is such a, okay, I'm really excited. Yeah. Can you please walk us through this whole, how did you even get a Grammy nomination? And what is this process like? Like, give us a little bit of that before we actually hit raising the bar. Yeah, I, um, so much of the Grammy, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's how life works. Like. I was in the right place at the right time with the right project. And then I just worked my tail off. Like, um, and so I, when I first got the job with the Philharmonic Chorus, 
it's a it's like a separate um, nonprofit from the orchestra, but we're the principal partner for choir, choral music. So the conductor Joanne Folletta is a wonderful, um, a wonderful conductor, wonderful person, and she has her friend Richard Daniel Poor, the composer, from Juilliard days, from from college days. So it's all these connections, you know, that you build at, throughout your lifetime. Well, he had this piece that he'd been working on for ten or twelve um, years or so. It's his baby called the Passion of Yeshua, and Joanne helped bring it to the fore like it was a co-commissioned by the Phil buffalo philharmonic and the organ bach festival and another foundation and so she's like well i we will we will mount it we will record it for naxos and so when i got the job she sat me down and said okay we have this project in like four years <laughs> and they <laughs> knew that it was coming for okay that's another yeah. skill look at how far out you're planning if you yeah. see the big picture oh this is so good okay so, so, so was, it, might, it was like three or four years before it even was all like gonna happen i'm like oh wow this is great and and i even like you know kept like i'm like I had a couple of opportunities to do other things i'm like no i really want to do this project you know um um to move maybe or go to another place um and and it and it, and it paid off i mean this was this was richard daniel Poor's baby he like he nursed it and he pushed it and pushed it and pushed it with um the grammy situation all of that is kind of very political and um insider stuff and he's based in la so like he's right there where it's all happening um and he really pushed it and it got the the recording um we we i was able to work with a new colleague james bass who is the choral director of choral studies at UCLA and his chamber singers came out and joined the Philharmonic Chorus. And um, so there was a great exchange in that way where yes. they got to like be on stage with a professional group. But we also like my singers got to see this young, fresh enthusiasm, mm -hmm. um, particularly for a piece that was kind of hard to sink our teeth into at first. Um, and so just just all these things sort of came together at the right time. It was I was in the right place. And I, we I mean, I was. I called so many extra rehearsals for that <laughs> preparation. And I remember Joanne Folletta usually comes to visit the, the chorus just the week before a concert season. She came like two or three weeks before, I think it was three weeks before the actual performance, just to like check in, you know, and see mm -hmm. if everything was okay. Um, and that really helped everybody sort of gain the seriousness of it and 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 helped helped us know what we really needed to focus on in those last two weeks to get together. So it was just kind of all those things happened and um, it happens to be like, and, and Joanne Folletta does a lot of um, recording for Naxos. She's won three Grammys already. And this recording just happened to be a choral piece that, you know, I was in the neighborhood for. So, um, so it was, it's, it's a lot, it was a lot of fun. I worked hard to try to get the singers to get to that level. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's what I'd like you to talk about a little bit today. Definitely. Uh, just before we dive into how to raise the bar so we can make this applicable, I just want to point out a few things that you said that are resonating right now, hardcore. I like feel vibrations. So you did a lot of hard work with intentionality focused on a goal. You shared that goal with everyone around you, including your choristers. You collaborated with people. You had partnerships with people. And you were not afraid to call the extra rehearsals, to put in the extra time and to say no to other opportunities so you could focus on that one goal. I don't know who needs to hear that, but man, <laughs> this is a great story. Okay, let's talk about how you raised the bar. So this is a group of amateurs with right. you. How yeah. did you get them to professional level, to Grammy nominated level? Well, I think, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this now that's actually happened. Um, and I've been reading a lot of sort of organizational management ideas too. And you sort of just, and it's so much of what we do as, as, as teachers and conductors is to tap into the strengths of the people that we have in front of us. And so that's, and that's part of it is sort of recognizing who is there in the room and what are their strengths and what kind of, um, what, what, what can they give to this team endeavor? Cause it is a team endeavor. And so, um, and knowing their strengths, but also knowing their weaknesses. So I sort of plan primarily more for their weaknesses than their strengths. What do I need to bone up and shore up for them? Um, and then knowing like how that, how people respond, how are they going to respond to certain, um, certain things that I say, certain um, uh, elements that we do in rehearsal, um, what is going to motivate them? How are they going to respond? So it's really about knowing your people and that's yeah, it's so, your community. It's like Ed's life, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's so, it's so important and knowing, and you know, this group, um, 
is it, they're all lovers and they really want to they want to do the absolute best they can and so i just sort of said to them from the beginning this this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us and for you to to premiere this piece to do beyond a recording a world premiere recording that when you know the graduate students at the university of michigan are studying passions they're going to listen to you you know they're going to pull out the recording and it's going to be you you're going to be the definitive performance of this piece. And so that kind of really resonated with people to sort of say, okay, this is really important. Um, you and shared so I, your why to the community. Yeah. Did you do that? Sorry to interrupt. Did you do that at year three or two or when did, or the year you recorded it? When did you actually start verbalizing the um, vastness and the possibilities of this project with the singers? When it was, it was the start of the season. So the, the okay. concert happened, I think in April and we, st we started work on it probably October, November, um, but really dug into it in January, starting in January. Um, but I sort of, but, but you know, this, you see it on the schedule and everybody's more excited about um, the Mozart Requiem because they know that piece and they can, re they, it resonates with them and they love it. And it's, it's amazing. It's a great piece to do. I love doing that. But I, you really need to, when you, in order to raise the bar, I think you really need to lay out the stakes. What is, what are the stakes? And it's not just for a group like this it's for kids too like you know mm -hmm. this is the one chance that you're you know that um these people get to hear you sing right or mm -hmm. um i remember being taught um at the what in the american boy choir you know no matter who's in the audience they've come and they need to hear you sing right so that's the stakes mm -hmm. for this performance um first of all they paid money <laughs> you have to give them mm -hmm. the best because they paid money but more importantly whether it's two people or two thousand they're there because they're there to hear something and, to, and to, to experience what you have to offer. Um, and so, so laying out the stakes for it was, was, was crucial. And, and two, seeing it on the calendar, it's like, oh, what is this piece? It's, in, it's got a weird title, Richard Danielport, I don't know who that is. Um, mm -hmm. It looks like it's in Hebrew, which is not a huge hurdle, but it's a little bit of like, you know, a little foreign for most- A little out of people's comfort zones. A little zones. out of people's comfort zones, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and so I sort of talk, just had to talk about it, you know, and I talked about it as part of the tradition of the Bach passions because something they can relate to. Um, we had luckily just uh, a couple of years before done Bernstein's Chichester Psalms, and there's a lot of similarities with that, um, particularly in terms of text and, and some of the... Um... Did you plan that intentionally? Nope. <laughs> but you made the connection and you made the oh, transfer. Made the yeah. Yeah. That's um, making their eyes open to the transfer, to the connections, to something familiar. I actually just heard a little quote about how, you know, if you're a boat in harbor, you're safe. But boats weren't actually designed to be in a harbor. They were designed to be out in the water. But to get to the water, you have to go through the ravine. And the ravine is scary. And it's things you don't know. But it's surrounded by your comfort zone. So if you jump out of your comfort zone and into that ravine, you jumped out of Mozart into this amazing new piece and look what came out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, and I bet if we, if I, after all, after everything happened, even before the Grammy nomination, just be on the recording and being part of the experience. I, I bet, you know, if we went down the row, most, you know, more, the majority of people would say this was one of their most, um, um, inspiring and, and memorable musical experiences, just mm -hmm. going through the process of all that. And so it's it's really about getting the getting everybody invested in some way, mm -hmm. speaking to them so that they can get invested. And um, and I think about you know um, the literature for for the business world. It's all about you know you have you have to meet deadlines, right? And so how do you motivate people to meet the deadline? Well, you you build in um, motivations, you build in um, bonuses, you build in all kinds of incentives to get there. And so and in 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 my world, it was sort of like these are the incentives, like this is going to be a unique experience, the one of a kind kind of thing, you know, those are the incentives mm -hmm. that be meet people on the path to get to that, um, to that deadline, because it is a deadline. And um, I've had fun conversations with some of the players in the orchestra, it's really stressful. I mean, I definitely lost some sleep over this piece. <laughs> no doubt. It. But one of the conversations I've had with a, a, a buddy of mine who, who studied, went to Interlochen for high school, a great music um, art school, did his master's and bachelor's at Juilliard and um and he's the principal trombone player and he's like you know and I'm like you know I feel like I'm only really as good as my last concert you know <laughs> that's yeah. how high the stakes are sometimes and he's like yeah yes. I had a teacher once say you're only as good as the last note you play because it's which is really you know humbling to think about it's it's kind of a 
it, it takes all the process out of it. But it, it, to a point, it's true. Like you have to, you're always trying to, to increase, to raise that bar. You're always trying to like mm -hmm. make, um, um, actually, you know, get, get to the best of your potential, actualize your best potential with mm -hmm. every, every step of the way. So, so um, you start with getting them invested and then yeah. you told them how to stay motivated through it and you related it to business practices. Oh, I'm sorry I interrupted you. This is just so good. Like I feel like people need to be taking notes because this is so transferable to your classroom, to your project, to your life. What happened as you started, once they were invested and they were motivated to those checkpoints, to the, to the little bonuses along the way? What was it like in rehearsals? What are other um, things you it was, did? It was pretty intense. Um, and this is where I think it, um, some of times in, in education, and I get bogged down in teaching, like I'm really trying to get people to, to, to teach them what I want them to know. And um, I've, I've learned a little bit along the way, like from one of Dr. Bauer's, Judy Bauer's things is she teaches the rules of expressive singing. So I, I teach that and I give my, give, and I, I think of that more as tools. I'm giving my singers tools. So I give them a marked score. I give them a pronunciation and translation and I give them these kinds of tools. And I assume that they're smart. I assume that they're going to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't kind of dwell on hammering that kind of stuff home. It's more about um, getting the, getting everything to come together. Um, and, uh, and I, I sort of want them to figure things out, make this, like you said, make transfers um, and, and make connections. And so I expected them to work outside of class rehearsal. Um, I gave them clear assignments like, okay, by this date, we're going to work on this and you need to have it learned. And I might call on you in rehearsal, you know, and they, so they knew clearly what the expectations were, the deadlines were, but I also let, you know, gave them the tools to, to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, and I don't always sort of, and I try not to like dwell on, okay, it's a long note. You've got a crescendo. Like, I, I, I sort of said, what do we do on that long note so that they know what they're supposed to do um, rather than tell them, I sort of, I, I want to, I, I assume that they are smart and want to be there. And in most, I, this is not true for all um, music situations, but for a lot of them, or at least the ones that I found myself in, most people choose to be there for, in mm -hmm. some way. Um, you know, and I, I realize that there are some general ed classes where people are just dumped into a classroom. Um, but in, where, I, where I am at a college, the kids have chosen to be music majors. Um, mm -hmm. And in the adult world, they've chosen to give up three hours every, every week. And so I assume that that, you know, that starting point, that they're going to be smart and they're going to take ownership um, and sort of just expect that as the norm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that helps them a lot too. just sort of do it because, you know, it's, it's already an expectation. So you gave them clear expectations. You're building that empowered community out yeah. of a group of amateurs by sharing where we're going. Here's your motivation. Here are yeah. the tools. Like this is so helpful. Okay, what's next? Um, and and uh, well, talking about giving the expectations is also like being really clear. Um, and this is something I also learned at Florida State. Um, but you know, but well, I learned along the way. But clearly, it came out at Florida State. Um, the idea of like. Um, limited teacher talk, be very clear mm -hmm. and specific. First of all, it saves a lot of time, but it really helps people, um, uh, again, invest, give, give themselves invested rather than you trying to tell them what to do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the whole seven words or less thing that, that Jessica Annapolis has talked about um, and giving them specific, um, clear routines, you know, how I tell them where we're starting is always the same. So they know it can find it right away. It's never kind of, oh, I wonder where he is. Mm -hmm. um and and when i rehearse i really try really hard to use musical terms musical nomenclature because i i'm going to assume that they're smart and they know it and if they don't they'll figure it out you know particularly with college kids like they don't always know what some of these things mean but by expecting them to know it they're gonna have to figure it out um mm -hmm. and and then i give them the why why if, if i'm asking for a certain um style characteristic or a certain you know breath mark in a certain place, I tell them, I give them kind of why, so that, um, um, just so that they can make the connection and then do it themselves the next time, right? And it also helps mm -hmm. them um, understand my investment in the music. Um, you know, I see it this way, I hear it this way, I think this is gonna be the best for everyone to bring it together that way. So I try to, you know, if, if, particularly if there's like a, you know, specific musical decision that we've that, that has been made um 
uh, tell them why, why, why we want to keep carry through there. Maybe it has to do with the text. Maybe it has to do with the larger architecture of the phrase. Um, but, but those, those kinds of simple things. So it's not arbitrary. It is something that they can make a connection to and then, you know, um, use later on. It really does build that community too. I mean, all, all these pieces are almost step-by-step processes, but they all work well together. What you're telling us, these tools, and if whoever is listening doesn't get anything else other than seven words or less, tell them exactly (laughs) what you want and why in the same direction in the music every time, man, that might change some people's lives right then and there. Yeah. And I, you know, honestly, I, I can go on and on in rehearsal. Like I can, you know, can't we all not because i want to hear myself talk or anything but just because like i think i get really excited you know and enthusiastic about things and i want to say oh but this and this and this yes Um, but so much of it is rather i've learned so much of it is not just me telling them they need to be enthusiastic but it's helped showing them so that they can become enthusiastic on their own right Mm -hmm. they can become committed Mm -hmm. and invested to the music and the music making process on their own and that's why I sort of take the take the assumption, assume that they're going to do it, assume that they're going to be smart, assume that they're going to um, work hard. And so much of I, I think about, you know, every I, I really wish we could have like a team meeting every week. You know how like in offices they have a team meeting. Mm-hmm. OK, well, how are we doing on this? How are we doing on this? And everybody gets to like um, to, to chime in and show their accountability and and, and, and offer a little bit. And we don't have time to do that most of the time, <laughs> but there are times when I like to like point out, you know, ask people, okay, well, what is, where's the, what, what's, what's really hard for you right now? Or, you know, why, why do you think we're doing this? Um, and, and with college students, I have more time and I try to get them to, um, get them to sort of think more creatively and because that helps prepare that they're younger and help prepare them. I don't know why, but, um, so I, oftentimes I'll just give them index cards and I'll have them like jot down, you know, a prompt a question to a prompt about the music or where where what's working and what's not working so that they can Mm -hmm. they can be accountable to themselves and and point out things for for me that i might not know um so i i I really i'm trying to figure out this concept of the team meeting and how to make it work in a rehearsal situation without taking more than you know five minutes (laughs) it's hard we we've been using google forms because we've been virtual this whole time which i want to talk about in a second how you did all of this through the pandemic but we'll get there in a second we've been doing forms at like google forms at the end of every rehearsal they click on a link in their choir classroom and submit what did i learn this week what do i need help on this is what i thought of rehearsal this is what i want you to know and they do it every week and it has been so helpful to hear it's like as they're waving goodbye in the Zoom room. But I'm like, how am I going to make this a thing in real rehearsal time? But those team meetings, I love how you're making the connection to the business world because choir is ultimately one ginormous people business. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think of it like you know, talk, it's, it's, it, it is, we are, I mean, we as leaders are literally like working with a team of some mm-hmm. sort, right? And mm-hmm. so it's all about team um teamwork and team training and team motivation and all of that stuff. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to like think about how it's one of my, my, my things right now is trying to figure out how to make it work more, be- make it work more better, right? How to make yeah, it work, work, work more, more better and efficiently and get people involved and accountable. So I love this form idea. I love this feedback. And one thing we've done with uh, the Philharmonic course is we've done feedback and I stole this from Tim Selig, steal everything that is a great idea. Um, mm-hmm. He, he has accountability forms and they, I, we use Google Forms, and so I call them musical mishaps. Um, and so that way, nobody can ra- can raise their hand in a rehearsal. <laughs> if something comes up, you right. you either, you, write, you note it, and then you can send me a form, and I'll figure it out. Oh, or you I can love let the that. section leader know. You know, like that saves a ton of time in rehearsals. Yes. Um, and and the other is like just another kind of accountability. So this this didn't happen right, or um, we had trouble getting off and on stage because of this. And so that's more for like. Mm-hmm. The logistical kinds of things um but it also the people will have a lot of interesting things to say about rehearsing and like well we spent a really long time on this i don't know why and it often comes off kind of a little bit of acerbic or aggressive but at the, at the same time it's really helpful to um to to consider what how what the experience of the person in the chair in front of you is is, is like um, you're giving so them you, a voice yeah. you're not just giving them a, a place to be accountable or to share but you're giving them a voice which goes all the way back in the circle to this beautiful community that you built that was almost like a 
it's like you created this bubble of that fostered empowerment and motivation and goal-oriented progress towards this massive thing. But all these little things along the way created the the bubble culture. It's yeah. really cool. A bubble yeah. in a good way, not a bad way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think part of it too is I sort of said, I, I said it to myself early on, particularly in the process for this um, this recording, was like, okay, it's got to be good. So what am I going to do? What can I do differently to, to change how people approach rehearsal, how people approach the ensemble? Not in a massive you know, um, structurally different way, but just come at it with a little bit more, um, with a different, slightly different approach, you know, um, to, to sort of under, undergird what we, what, what the seriousness of it is, but also how they can, how we can do better than we think we can, you know, and mm -hmm. so much of, um, so much of raising the bar is letting people know that they can do better than they think they can, right? Setting um, those high expectations. That finding a way for people, yeah, and finding a way for people to do their their best. Um, mm -hmm. If it's on the soccer field, like the rest of the team makes space for that really good player to like do all of his moves. And so how do we do that in a core rehearsal? Well, we, we give everybody the right tools so that everybody can, can jump up to the next level of what the, the star singer is doing and then the star singer can do even more right mm -hmm. you know even more leadership in, in the kinds of stuff that they're doing in the rehearsal you're raising the bar for everyone everyone's bar is going to be at a different space but the key is we're all just raising our bar together whatever yeah. that next level is for you through communication empowerment community building tools resources communication all the all the great words that you're sharing how did how did you do all this in a pandemic? Because you said you started rehearsals in January, and I'm assuming that's January of 2020. So I'm dying to know how did well, this all really happen. Well, um, when um, the actually it was the the, the performance and recording happened in 2019. Okay. So it was released in 2020. So that was okay. lucky. We got everything done. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was really stressed about that. I'm like, how did we do this in 2020? Because so, it said 2020. Okay, you did it all in 19. Yeah. Yeah, we all did all in 19. And we were very fortunate in that our 2019, 2020 season was basically all of our orchestral stuff was done in February. We had done everything. Wow. Before. So we had, we had a big, we had two big concerts canceled. Um, and we're going to remount them next year in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they were kind of independently produced concerts that um, were, were slightly different. So what we've been doing in the pandemic, we have not done anything, you know, wild and crazy. Um, uh, innovative. We've done been doing the Zoom rehearsals. We've been mixing it up with social time, and um, we've been doing some enrichment um, time right now, which has been really nice. Um, I stole this from Michael Hanewald and the Dallas Community Chorus. Um, you know, we I, we do a session on vocal training and how to keep your voice fresh because they haven't been singing for mm -hmm. ten months a year. We do. I did a session on the background of Four I Requiem. We had our piano our accompanist who's a fabulous harpsichord player talk about the harpsichord and how cool. it works and because we do messiah every year and we use the harpsichord so like she got to show that off and everybody was just flabbergasted like wow you do all of that <laughs> and That's, it's like yeah so you're building that community though like you set the tone adam you have to know that what you did in this whole 2019 set the tone for your choir to be successful in the pandemic because they have this beautiful community and you're yeah. fostering it through all of this oh, I'm Really thankful you're sharing this story. <laughs> we did we did do one really cool project in the in the in the fall in that we um, we do a big messiah every year sell out two venues two thousand some people um, and we couldn't do that so um, I thought I had this vision of like doing a video performance of messiah in a bunch of different spaces because Buffalo is just an architectural gem of a city there's just such amazing turn of century architecture so much there's and that we could just we could do a concert in a different venue for like six or seven years and it would be magnificent it's just there's so much so much great architecture so we ended up using four spaces but um i recorded small groups spaced out with masks um singing along to a pre-recorded that we a uh, string quartet that i pre-recorded with <laughs> in the concert hall so they were listening with an earbud singing alive in a church while i was conducting along with the earbud and we videoed it and it was on PBS, the local PBS station. And it turned out really cool um, because it showed off all these different buildings in Buffalo. And, you know, it was it's very much a product of the pandemic. Um, but it, 
but it was it, it turned out really well and it's that everybody sort of that was something to look forward to again like a mm. project like this is different we're gonna find a way to do messiah because it's like our thing um and you spotlighted your community yeah. look at yeah. you being aware this is, so, <laughs> this is such good stuff we all need to hear so, I feel yeah. like I could go raise the bar on something. I, I'm, I'm going to have a big brainstorm session after this. I just feel it coming. This has been super helpful. Okay, is there anything else on your raising the bar list that we need to know before I ask you the final question? Well, I think, um, no, that's pretty much it. You know, it just, just it's so much like to, to, to rehash it. It's sort of like knowing who your people are, right? Laying out the stakes for them, you know, getting them on board, invested in what you're doing. Um, assume that they want to be there. I, I like the idea that assume that they're smart. You know, people are smarter than we think they are, um, and and make and can make connections. And really, particularly if they're invested in what you're doing, let them figure things out. Um, give them clear instructions and clear expectations, and then um, reap the rewards. Oh, so perfectly summarized. Thank you. I always let the guest share one thing that really matters that you want the listener to walk away with. So. The floor is all yours. Other than raising the bar and a million other things you've shared us, with what is the thing that matters? Um, the, one of the, the thing that matters that I've learned is that you know it's um, making music with people is about the people who are in the room with you, right? You've got to you've got to you've got to serve and lead the people who are there, and not necessarily the people you want to be there or the people that you have dreams about. Um, and so it's so much of knowing who those people are. Um, so much of getting for me, getting out of my comfort zone and like chat, have, making small talk with them and knowing who they are and where they come from and what their motivations are for being there. Um, and then understanding their talents and their weaknesses. It's important to know where people need support and help. Um, and so um, all of all of that, you know, it's it's a little bit um, cliche to say it's all about the people. But I think that um, that's I think that that's how you can really raise the bars. You have to you have to look around the room and use the talents and skills of the people who are there and highlight them. I think that's what good leaders do in general. They sort of can look around and say, this person's really good at that. And this person's really good at that. And I need to help them with this, I need to help them with that. And I could, well, maybe, maybe, maybe Susie can help John with that, you know, that seeing all of those connections and seeing that. So it's, it's about knowing who, who, who you're with, I think. That's so beautiful. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lubke. Well, thank you for the time. It's been great to see you again in the chat. Yes, we will definitely talk more soon. I'm really excited to go raise the bar. I'm going to go have like a huge brainstorm session now. <laughs> people. It's about the people. Raise the bar by getting the most out of your singers, knowing the, where they are, what they need, what tools they need, and leading with empathy. You too can be at the right place at the right time, but you have to work. Make those life connections, make the transferable skills, use organizational management techniques from the business world, and collaborate and tap into the strengths of the people around you. Stop now and think, who's in the room with you? And what can you give them to empower your team? I cannot wait to hear how you raise the bar. Please reach out and let me know. You can find me on Instagram, Dr. Emmy B. Connect with me, emilybirch.org slash contact, or better yet, join the conversation over at patreon.com slash musicedmatters. I'm really thankful that every week I get to help you think about things and learn and grow. And it is an honor to be your host. Thank you for giving me ideas and options to raise the bar in my own personal world every day. So in case no one has told you, you matter. Obviously music matters. And I'll see you next time on the Music Ed Matters podcast. <laughs>